But yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm so excited. This is the new age of social media session um, where we're gonna be talking to Charlie Sutton, uh, VP and head of design at Facebook. Um, so I just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Adriana Torres. I am a junior advertising major at the University of Texas. Um, and I am also a co-founder of TPO. Um, so I'm so excited to be interviewing Charlie along with Sandra. I'm Sandra. I'm a junior also at the University of Texas at Austin. I am a design major and I am the design lead for TPO and I'm really excited to be here as well. I'll yeah. go next. I should do a proper introduction. Um, so my name is Charlie Sutton. As Adriana mentioned, I look after the design team at Facebook app. I'm also a designer. I guess I would probably call myself um, an interaction designer um, by trade. And um, so sometimes my accent is a little bit confusing. I'm actually Australian, but I spent a long time in London. So sometimes some of my words sound a bit funny as like they move between London, California and Australia. Um, mm -hmm. And I've, I've been at Facebook for almost six years now. Um, and my, my history is more sort of in hardware companies like places like Samsung and and Nokia and Apple. And I'm just so thrilled to be here with both of you and to spend some time together. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. Um, I think we can go ahead and just start into um, our questions and our intro, our official intro. Um, so let me go ahead and unshare my screen. Cool. Um, so yeah, so I actually met Charlie uh, when I was a Facebook University uh, product design intern last summer, and I was working remotely um, and joined uh, a fireside chat uh, with Charlie and I think uh, Brianne Miller as well. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was going to be like 20 other interns in there, um, but surprisingly, I ended up being the only intern um, and like the video call with like these amazing and successful creatives uh, like i was pretty like starstruck because this was i think the first opportunity i kind of got to like talk one-on-one -on -one with uh like someone who is like su successful in like the design world that way um and it was just really exciting and i got a lot of like really great advice from y'all about like you know, trying to get into the design world. And so just to give everybody a little bit more background on your um, your background, I'll just uh, read your intro. Um, so like Charlie is the head of design for the Facebook app um, and he looks over uh, like the 400 plus person design organization. And as a leader, um, he has grown and managed teams uh, for almost 20 years at companies including Apple, Nokia, Samsung, and he specializes in interaction design uh, for mobile, 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 <laughs> and has extensive experience in developing uh, for both physical products and AR, VR. And Charlie is passionate about teaching and building skills in the new generation of designers and is an occasional lecturer at California College of Arts. Um, so with that, I think we can go ahead and, you know, jump into our first question that kind of relates. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, let's get started. So Charlie, in college, we noticed that you studied philosophy <laughs> and some of your first roles after college were in business development. So what drove you to design roles? It's a good question. Um, I don't often scroll far back enough on LinkedIn to see this, but yeah, I, I have an interesting career path and maybe it's worth thinking about what technology was like in the early 1990s. That's when I was going to university for the first time, 1993. And this is largely pre uh, widely available internet. So universities and colleges had internet, uh, but really it wasn't a, a sort of a wide thing that many people were doing. There was sort of the CD-ROM, or maybe even pre the CD-ROM era, like this is how far ago it was. And I think like a lot of people, when we're making choices about our life, we look at those people around us and we kind of model off them. And I, I didn't have many people in my life who were making a living as a creative person. I had a lot of creative people around me, my family, very creative, very artistic, but I just didn't see a path. You know, I didn't 
maybe graphic design I had kind of heard of and I knew of architecture, but I, I didn't even know what industrial design was. So I think I'm a product of my time where a lot of people looked at more traditional professions and they said, look, I have to, you know, I have to sort of make a living at some stage. So what I did is I did a, what's called a dual degree where I did arts so I could hopefully realize a bit of my creative urges. And I did law as well, because I figured one day I had to make some money. But um, increasingly, as I got through my studies, I realized that um, the law wasn't for me. And um, I actually started working in the local uh, technology store at the university and got to know people who were working for different companies. And one of those companies was, was Apple. Um, and at that time, um, that was my way of getting into the technology industry. I'd always wanted to be in and around computers. And so, yeah, this was my opportunity. And so I started um, through professional services. Um, at that time, uh, you know, I, this is again a long time ago. It's just when notebooks were becoming big and particularly a lot of schools were beginning to invest in notebooks. And actually State of Maine did one of the biggest ever orders of notebooks. This is... Um, it was a huge thing back in the day when they decided to give a lot of students access to iBooks. And what Apple didn't know how to do at the time is we can't just drop them on the door of the school and walk away. We have to have some way of like getting them into the hands of students and making sure they've got the right software on them, making sure they can be looked after. And so my job at Apple was to figure out how to build those services so that these you know, iBooks could get into students' hands. So it was an odd way to start, but you know, in a way, I'm really glad I went in that direction because it taught me about a different end of technology. You know, when you're trying to figure out how to fix broken iBooks in a tiny country town in Australia for students, you kind of get a wider view of what it means to work in technology. So I'm kind of glad that I went in reverse, but I always had that creative urge in me. And I think I probably expressed it through I was the person making the slides and doing the brochures and making the pamphlets. I was doing my best at desktop publishing. And um, so I think I was always trying to sort of let that creative urge out. And luckily over time, I got more and more opportunities. And as the industry matured more, and there was more call for people to particularly work in digital product experiences, then yeah, over the next 20 years, I kind of wound my way through and, and found my way here at the end. So I feel very fortunate and I'm always, um, I always wanna call out that it takes a lot of privilege and a lot of coincidences to end up where I am um, in addition to work. Um, and I'm very mindful of the fact that I was just lucky to have good sponsors along the way and, and have opportunities a lot of people don't have. So, so yeah, I'm, I have got a degree in arts and philosophy, um, which comes in useful more often than you would realize. So, um, but I'm glad I have this unusual story. I think it um, makes me see the world differently. Definitely like gives you a specific like or like a different perspective. Um, and it's really interesting just to see like how much things have changed while you mm. have been in the industry. Um, and it's just really exciting. Um, and I think this then our next question kind of like um, plays into this, um, but like Facebook has expanded many of its features, uh, such as Messenger, uh, Rooms and Community Help features because of the pandemic. Um, and in what ways do you think COVID-19 affected social media and what new trends will emerge because of this impact? Um, just because it's so crazy that like things have changed so fast and now with COVID, like things uh, as we have all seen, like have changed so fast and we've adapted. So. Mm. I read um, a book recently, so I don't want to take credit for this, but something in the book really resonated with me um, by a fairly famous um, professor, Scott Galloway. And his theory about the pandemic is it's an accelerant. And I, and I agree with that. It's almost like what happened in the space of a year and a half is we shifted the entire industry forward 10 years. So for years and years, we'd been thinking like you, so many white papers got written about telemedicine. You know, telemedicine is coming. It's been coming since the 1990s. Um, but what the pandemic did is it, it caused it to jump ahead. And so now we almost have an acceptance of remote medicine and, and talking to a doctor via the internet that we expected to have in 2030. So it's, I, I don't know whether 10 years is the right number, but when people 
talk to me about how it has changed technology trends, I almost think of it like, maybe let's be cons more conservative. It's accelerated everything by five years. Another great example is virtual reality. Virtual reality, um, I think, shifted more into the mainstream because people suddenly were in a position where they needed to live virtually. And so I think for a lot of people, their acceptance of that technology just jumped. It, it like skipped multiple generations. So I think in many parts of the industry we work in, I like to think of what if it's 2026? Like that's the simplest rule of thumb I could think. Whatever we predicted would happen by the mid 2020s, in some ways has happened. Um, so I think that's, I think of it as an accelerant. Now it's not perfectly symmetrical. It's not like everything moved forward the same amount of time, something less, some things more. And in some ways, a lot of things haven't changed. Um, you know, a really good example is we see that um, inequalities in society still impact who gets medical care. They still impact where COVID-19 has had the greatest, um, you know, sort of negative impacts in communities. But at, within the technology industry, at least, I kind of feel like it just flipped a bit and we all move forward by a huge jump. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it. And when I think of all the particular technologies, messaging, um, video conferencing, like I, for the years, it used to be big enterprise companies would predict that every home would have a video conferencing system. Like you can look at old videos from the 1960s and they predict everyone does work via video conferencing. And then suddenly in a moment, even though all the technology was there, we jumped forward and culturally we now accept that it's entirely possible to work remotely, which is a huge jump. It, like, it literally could be a, a generational jump in acceptance. So that's kind of my model. I'm not gonna take any credit for it. Someone else thought of that idea, but it really did resonate with me. We have a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. So they're asking, I'm curious about your thoughts on the AR VR arena and how it would change the ways the way we do things, especially in social media space as an interface versus screens and how big of a shift is this? Oh, look, we could easily spend 45 minutes on this topic because it's so deep. Um, and I, I did work in AR VR for a while, so I definitely have kind of different opinions about where the industry is going. Maybe I'll just think, put two things in people's minds. The first one is for the entire history of media consumption. You can go back to the book, you know, go back 2000 years, everything has been through a bounded rectangle. Your television's a rectangle, your newspaper's a rectangle, your phone is a rectangle. Um, and now with AR and VR, the rectangle is gone, which is sounds like a trivial thing, but it's an incredible change because what it means is our interaction suddenly becomes unbounded. So we can be a part of a virtual world or it can be augmented objects placed in the physical world. And I think, Human beings are spatial creatures. We understand the world through the relationship of our body to the world. And the rectangle makes it all a concept. Like you have to sort of imagine what it would be like. But the wonderful thing about AR and VR, and this will affect UI design, interaction design, industrial design, services design, is it lets us be back in our bodies again. So we can interact with things spatially. We can understand our awareness to things. So. I'd imagine it would change every part of interaction design because we are no longer bounded by the rectangle. And if you look around you, you realize literally everything is a rectangle. So it's maybe one of the biggest changes in technology in 2000 years, bigger than the smartphone even. Um, the other thing which I think is super interesting about AR, VR is that people get very obsessed about the technology. It's like, is it 4K, is it 8K per eye, is it 90 frames a second, is the field of view this many degrees? But what's super interesting is that what matters more in a spatial world is not resolution, it's actually just the ability to create change. So anyone who's ever used AR and VR, very quickly you kind of get bored of how good things look. And what amazes you is that you can reach out and you can make something happen. You actually have agency in this world. You can cause the world to change. And I think that's one of the deepest human motivations there is. Fantastic example from someone else again, the Stanford, there's a Stanford laboratory that's focused on VR under someone called Jeremy Bellstock for like 15, 20 years. They did an experiment where they got someone to cut down a tree in virtual reality. And it was like really, you just had a lever 
and you just cut down a tree. And what they, what they were able to prove that, is that those people had a higher ecological awareness than the baseline because they cut down the tree themselves. They had agency. It wasn't a concept, deforestation as a concept. They did the thing spatially and our brains operate very differently. So I think if you imagine we're going to leave the rectangle behind, that is huge. And I, I don't even know the number of ways that will change design. And then if you think about a world where I have agency, I can cause things to happen. I think this could be one of the biggest changes in how we relate to technology. Um, but it will take time and it will take probably different generations of technological advancement to really be as natural as a smartphone. Because the thing I always remember is these have been around for, I don't know, like 20 years. It's probably taken maybe $100 billion of subsidies from telecoms companies. Like, you know how we don't all pay for phones, like, outright? And AR and VR has got none of that. So I, I think sometimes we compare it to smartphones. I'm like, whoa, 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 give it 15 years and give it $100 billion of subsidies, and then we'll see how big it can be. And I think it is... It's going to be such a change, but we could legit talk about that for 45 minutes. So <laughs> that's my short answer. No, yeah, it's also really interesting, um, like that uh, concept about like just like moving outside of that box. Um, I recently read, um, I think it was the best interface is no interface mm -hmm. by um, I think it was Golden. Krishna, um, and it talks about that concept about how we have to like in order to basically um, truly fulfill like like or make solutions for people we have to move outside of that like box and like like make it more natural um, mm -hmm. and like integrate that into interface design um, yeah. so I think that was really interesting speaking of this change um, we do have a question another question in the chat that kind of ties into our next question and, and of course um, with all these new emerging trends and changes happening, both companies, large companies, and designers ourselves have to adapt to that change. So the question in the chat is, how do large companies shift to fit the new developments that might not have been expected? And for um, beginner designers, what do you suggest they pick up as they break their way into the industry with these new tools and skill sets emerging? Yeah, one thing I've... I feel like that happens when you start out as a designer is that you're very focused on what you can see in front of you, the, the app, um, the phone, the bicycle. And you're very concerned on making sure that all the interactions with that thing work well. And you're very interested in craft and you think of all the things that could go wrong and you think of all the details. As, as I've sort of grown in my design career and, and sort of worked at different companies, I've realized that maybe the most important thing is to be aware of the other systems that impact that object or that experience. And so a great example is um, when you make a car, um, we all know there's got to be steel and there has to be battery and there needs to be gas and roads, but there also needs to be water. You use an enormous amount of water in, in manufacturing. What does the water come from? What happens to all the water that's been used and combined with all of those metal and batteries and and you begin to see there are systems within systems that affect other systems and i think the great designers and the great companies really understand those bigger systems so if there was any one skill i wish i had developed earlier and i would probably encourage younger designers to think about it is systems design um, and systems design actually comes from things like how people understand how ecological systems work. Like how does a rainforest work? Why does it rain? Where does the water go? Why does the soil act the way it does? It's also very common in complex systems. So if you run a nuclear power plant, if you're a designer making the, the user interface for a nuclear power plant, you are definitely aware of all the systems because someone could die. Um, but I, I think in design, sometimes we don't look at those bigger systems and systems design is really about one crucial thing is the choice of the right place to intervene. Um, and a really good example is if you want a rainforest to grow a certain type of fruit, you don't sort of structure the rainforest. You don't like put everything in rows. You probably encourage a bird to come there that will grow that type of fruit. And I, I think a lot of our technological systems, be they social media or commerce, are actually just as complex 
as a rainforest, but we kind of treat them like clockwork. We're like, why doesn't this do exactly what I asked it to do? And the reason is because it's such a complex system. So I think the short answer is systems design. That is really the future of interaction design. And I think for most of us, when we can see those bigger systems at work and we can maybe think, okay, do I pull a big lever or do I pull a tiny little lever? Then that's where we do really great design. And um, maybe to make it really tangible, if you think about a lot of you have used Apple products and um, you might remember the MagSafe adapter, so the magnetic power adapter. Um, that's a really beautiful small moment of interaction and in industrial design, but it's very aware of the human system that we like to do things blind. We like to sort of not have to look and we all know the pain of putting in a USB port and checking like which way is it up or down. People are aware of those bigger ergonomic systems and people are aware of the pleasure we get when something goes snap. Like that's a, that's a system of pleasure in the human body. So it's not just about the utility of plugging in something. It's about ergonomics and pleasure and ritual. So systems design, if I could, if I could recommend one thing is just to go as deep on that subject as you possibly can, because I think it is the future of our profession. Really interesting. Um, one of the questions we have in the Q&A is um, by Anonymous, and they are asking, where's the best place to learn more about system design methodology? methodology sorry. <laughs> There's a really great book um, and you don't have to buy the book because there's also an, uh, quite a lot of articles from the book by someone, her name is Danella Meadows, I think. Um, I'll have to double check. And she wrote a, 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 one, of, one of the textbooks about systems design. But if you also search for Danella, D-O-N-N-E-L-L-A, Meadows, M-E-A-D-O-W-S, and systems design, she has a, there's a great website. Unfortunately, she passed away um, so it, it, we're not going to get more books from her, but there's some articles there that I think are really useful. There's one great one I'd really recommend where it has in descending order, the least helpful thing to change a system and the most helpful thing, the least helpful thing to change a system is just changing the parameters, you know, like changing or a good example is changing interest rates is just changing the parameters in the financial system that doesn't change the system. Mm -hmm. But the most powerful thing you can do sometimes is to change the goals of the system. If you change what the monetary system is trying to do, then you change the whole system. Another really good one is positive feedback loops. You know, affirmation, rewards are more powerful in changing systems than negative feedback loops, punishment, control, constraints. So there's some really great articles on there. I hope I've pronounced her name correctly. Uh, Danella Meadows, I think, is the author. Really recommend her work. Yeah, that's really interesting. I will definitely also be looking into that. Um, um, I think to move on to our like next question. Um, so Facebook's mission is to give people um, the power to build a community and bring the world like closer together. Um, so designing for billions of people around the globe uh, with different needs comes with opportunities and challenges um, that no other company has faced. So what is your design process to make the Facebook app experience efficient and accessible to different users with different uh, needs? One, one interesting thing is we have many frameworks. There isn't one super process or one super methodology because I, I don't think any company has yet to figure out how to do this. And it doesn't matter what they make, whether they make soap or cars or social media networks. Anytime you're designing for that number of people and countries and cultures and societies and communities, I mean, that's a more complex problem than humanity has ever solved, like literally ever. So I think sometimes the first step is just to go, you're going to have to try every tool you know of. Um, I think in our industry, sometimes we want to think there's one tool or this is the best way to do it. But that's sort of like saying, what's the best way to organize humans? I mean, I don't know. Uh, are they in Tokyo? Are they in Jakarta? Are they 95 years old? Are they three months old? Organizing a three month old is pretty different to organizing a 95 year old. So I, I just think maybe the first thing in the framework is to accept that we don't 
perfectly know how to do it yet. And it, it could take, you know, I mean, Adriana and Sandra, it, it might even be beyond your generation of design. It, it could be designers who are here in 2050. Um, so the first thing is just have, have humility that it, you need dozens of tools and half of them won't work and half of them will only work in a, one particular case. And um, so step one, just accept, accept the problem as being bigger than anyone has ever faced before. Step two is try many, many things. So one framework we use is something called the people problems framework, which is really simple. It's very similar to the scientific method, actually. It's like a rebranded scientific method, but you know, we call it the people problems framework. And it basically just has four questions in it, which is, what is the problem? That's not too hard, although sometimes the problem is not actually a, a real person's problem. It's a company problem. So you have to actually figure out, is this a real person's problem or is this a company's problem? A good example is if you're a car company, if you say, what is the problem? We're not selling enough cars. That's not a problem people have. That's a problem your company has. Um, so I think the first question is like, what is the problem? And then the second question is, how do you know it's a problem? One of the big challenges when you're servicing or looking after millions or even thousands of users is how do you know that they all have the problem or that it's the most common problem? Um, so that's the second part of the people problems framework. The third part is, um, what solutions would address those things. Um, the fourth part of the people problems framework is really key is how would you know you've solved the problem? Like, is it selling the car? Is that when you know you've solved the problem or do you have to like check on the driver two years down the road to know if you've solved the problem? So actually these four simple questions in the people problems framework are pretty deep. And if you're very, very diligent about how you answer them, I think you actually have a pretty good framework for designing. Um, so that's one of the frameworks we use, but it's a little bit like asking a chef, um, what's the right knife to use in the kitchen? And you're like, well, oh, is it a fish? Is it, what are we, what are we dealing with here? Um, and then you have a kitchen with 3 billion people in it. So there's not going to be one super framework. And it looks like we've lost Adriana along the way. You've got it, Sandra. Take the reins. It's all you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing um, the people problems um, framework. So kind of following back up on mm -hmm. planning for people with different needs and um, their, the different opportunities that come up. Small design changes can have large unexpected repercussions that can affect users in many different ways. So when new features are added or the app undergoes significant design changes, how do you introduce and smoothly transition users through this updated experience? The second part of the question is probably a little bit more straightforward. We're very um, test centric at Facebook. Um, and I know a lot of companies in our space also do the same thing. So we, we might not announce it, but before we make a really big change, we have tested many, many smaller changes and we might have stopped or we might have realized it doesn't work. So you, when you're dealing with such a complex system, you can't just pull one big lever. Um, maybe a really, really simple example is, um, welcome back, Adriana. <laughs> uh, about six years ago, we added the capability to Facebook for you to view a 360 degree photo. Like, so you could see, some of you might've seen it on Google Street View. You know, it's just like having a photo sphere. We actually turned that on, that feature on, for everybody, like literally everyone who used the platform or who had a phone that was high enough performance. Um, that's very rare. In most cases you turn it on for like a thousand people and then 10,000 people. And then you check against a group of people who don't have it to make sure weird things aren't happening. So the second part is easy. You, just, you have to be very diligent about your testing and use a lot of research and data science to make sure you really know what's happening. Because if, if you can imagine when, um, when someone is looking at their screen, it's often very hard to know what they're feeling or thinking. We know that they looked at a video and the video lasted for 30 seconds, but to know whether it was something that made them happy or that was successful, you often need more information than that. So second part of the question is you have to be very diligent and careful in the way you release and you have to test, test, test to make sure you don't just pull a big lever and then the rainforest suddenly starts working totally differently than you expected. 
the first part, part of the question, I honestly think just comes down to principles. Um, one of the things that are really helpful in a complex system is you just need very powerful principles. And I think one really good principle, which again is not my idea, it's from um, someone um, who was a sociology and political science professor. Um, they wrote, wrote of this concept, which is essentially called the veil of justice. So like, how do you create a just society? Well, you make sure you don't get to choose your role. <laughs> like, if I'm Charlie, I'm going, is, it, is Norway a great place to live? I'm automatically thinking, is Norway a great place to live for Charlie? <laughs> and, he, and this writer suggests, well, you, what if you were randomized? What if you were Adriana or Sandra? Or what if you were a three month old or a 95 year old? That's how you tell if that's a good society to live in. And the way we bring that to technology is, what if you're designing the system for the most vulnerable user, the person who has the most at stake or the most risk, then that's a really good test that you're probably doing the right thing no matter what. And a really simple example is for, from accessibility. So, so many people in the world have some level of hearing impairment. It's not just people with hearing aids, it, like hearing impairment, covers, I think, at least 40 million Americans. Like, it's like 10% or more of the population. So one thing you can do is think, okay, this person's gonna be left out. If we release a product that is about audio and we don't have automatic closed captioning, this person is vulnerable. Suddenly they're not in power anymore. They don't have the capability. Um, so we prioritizing closed captions is protecting someone who is vulnerable in your system. But what's really interesting is often those improvements are great for everyone. Everyone uses closed captions. Every, like think of the number of videos we watch now with sound on or sound off where there are closed captions because that's become how we use video on the internet. That was a feature designed for someone who was more vulnerable, someone who didn't have power in the system. So it's a long answer, but it may be a really simple rule. If you have a principle which is optimize the system for the most vulnerable user of the system. And it could be vulnerability could mean many things. Like it could be economically, it could be socially, it could be an impairment, you know, hearing or seeing, it could be technological understanding. You will make a great product, I promise you, if you do that. And it will probably have things in it that are great for everybody. So that's probably how you sort of balance those design changes. Otherwise you have to think, well, what are 3 billion people need? And that's like not possible, right? You'd have to run research until the end of the universe. And even then, what would you do? Do an average? Like, so that's my rule of thumb. And I, I think we have many, many cases where we've seen in the technology industry that when you design for the most vulnerable user, it's a great product. Um, everything from can openers to, um, to videos on the internet. So I really believe in that principle. I agree. Um, I had never like thought about it uh, like that, but um, it makes sense. Like the most vulnerable uh, user will probably make like the best product for everybody um, just because it's so accessible. Um, so we have one of the questions in um, the chat. Um, from Anonymous. Um, so as you design to increase user engagement time, how do you know when that turns into a negative addiction for the user? How do you classify this design successful or how do you handle it? It's maybe three parts, this is a good question. There's maybe three parts. The answer is um, when we were talking earlier about the goals of the system, user engagement is a, is a metric, but it's not a goal. Um, it's not a good goal, and I'd recommend no company take it as a goal. It's a way to measure something is happening. Um, and, and I think we all instinctively know if user engagement drops dramatically, you're probably doing something wrong because people aren't finding it useful. But the goal for our system is to, um, where we can help uplift the world through safe and inclusive communities. That's the goal. Now, how would you measure? Well, first of all, you have to measure what safety is. You have to measure what inclusivity is. You have to measure what community is, because is this a community? Um, do I measure it by how often Sandra, Adriana and I get together? Like even the definitions of some of the things we're trying to help are very tricky to figure out. So 
user engagement is a, is a legitimate measure because it shows you if the system is working for the purpose that you might have designed it at a very fundamental task level. Um, and if you design a, a something that's poorly usable, you'll see in the, the steps that less and less and less and less people will complete it. So I think you should track that, but that's not a good goal for the system. It's just a measure of one part of the system's performance. Uh, in terms of how we know about things like well-being and whether these things become negative, it's actually a really complex question. I, I think because we have our intuition, like we all know the feeling like doom scrolling, like in COVID, like most of us were just sitting there doom scrolling the internet, trying to get to sleep. And that doesn't feel good. We, we know what it, it means when we feel uncomfortable having wasted our time. You know, it doesn't matter what product it's with. But to know whether someone's well-being has been affected is actually where we turn to a lot of people with PhDs and we're like, okay, how do we know this for sure? Um, because you can't survey 3 billion people 20 times a day. <laughs> that would irritate them a lot. And people don't always respond to surveys um, truthfully or they don't always know how to express themselves in a way that surveys can capture. So I think... You know, I, I'll give you a great analogy. Everyone's heard of like gross domestic product, um, which is like a really weird concept about like the basket. It's a basket of products like with milk in it and bread in it. And um, we all know gross domestic product is not the measure of whether a society is happy, but it is a valid measure in terms of whether certain economic things in the society are changing because it's good to have it as a constant. But it, the goal of the system should not be to increase GDP. The goal should be to increase human happiness, safety, you know, health and well-being. So I think proxy measures around user engagement are okay, as long as they're not goals of the system. And as long as we understand they're just proxies, just like GDP doesn't tell me whether Sandra's happy. It doesn't tell me whether everyone in Texas is happy. It doesn't tell me, that, but it is a valid measure as part of a much bigger basket. So what we try and do at Facebook is have a very big basket of things that we measure and try and be careful about what we have as goals. Um, and definitely just time is a very bad goal, um, which is why we don't have time spent as a goal of our system. Um, you should measure it. Or you should know whether it goes up or down because that means something, but it shouldn't be a goal. Yeah, um, that's really insightful. Uh, I think most people usually like try to focus on one metric um, to decide whether something is successful or not. Um, but you really do have to look at the, the big scope yeah. of things. Um, and so moving on to our next question um, that also kind of plays into what we were talking about. Um, so with Facebook being one of the biggest platforms uh, for sharing news and valuable information, um, ethical user experience design is crucial um, in helping promote responsible online behavior. So what does ethical design uh, mean to you? Interestingly, we use a different word and maybe that's part of my answer. Um, we use responsible design because I think there are many systems of ethics. This is, I, I, I knew we'd come back to philosophy in the end. Um, there are many ethical frameworks. What's the right one to choose? Is it utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number? Is it, is it a, a Western concept of ethics? Is it, well, so ethics is actually incredibly complex when it comes down to what is right and what is just and what is fair. Like we think we have these things as shared, easy, proxies for agreement. But if you look at this country or any country in the world, there is not one ethical system. In fact, there's violent disagreement about what is just and right and ethical and true. So we, we try not to use the word ethical, not that we don't believe in morals and ethics, of course we do, but because when you're trying to come up for with a system that works effectively for the planet, which includes people of many different faiths, backgrounds, educations, ethical frameworks, I think responsible. We have to have responsible design. And that means that you take as much care as you can to think through the consequences of the system and you take as many measures as you can so that you know how the system is working. You test very, very carefully and you try as many different tools as you can to ensure the system has 
positive outputs for your goals and you should try and have really good goals. So really an example is uh, we have the word safe and inclusive. Um, I think that's more responsible than just inclusive or just safe. So you can be safe, but not feel belonging. Like um, I'm on an airplane and I might feel safe, but I understand there's first class and economy class and the captain. So maybe I, I don't feel a sense of belonging with the people who are up there in first class. So responsible design, I think, is about, first of all, acknowledging there are many frameworks for what good is. Um, and coming up with some super framework is very difficult. So you try and be responsible. And really, that's just about, in some ways, having good principles and also having the right imagination. I think in tech, like we talk about imagination as innovation. Imagination means something new. So like um, innovation is a Tesla. Like it's a new thing that is different and we're excited by it. But I, I choose the word imagination very carefully because it should be a designer's job to imagine, to think about a possible future, the good ones and the bad ones, to have imagination that is um, about futures that may be different to what you want. Um, and so I think responsible design is how I'd frame it. I, I do think that word is the right word. And, and I particularly think that what we've got to do is try to kind of bring together all the things we've spoken about, better goals, better measures, more measures. We have to be more humble to say, I don't know how human, humanity works. No one does. If I did, I'd probably, um, I'd be a very rich person, very depressed person, or maybe I'd have my own religion. But like, literally, it's the most complex system imaginable. And we've got to try all these different tools and it will take four generations of the greatest designers in the world to even get close to knowing how to do responsible design for the planet. But we have to, in our generation, try as many things and be as careful and imaginative as we can. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I look at the problem. Because I imagine if we were having this conversation in 1972 about industrial design, like, why does it make so much plastic garbage? Why does it use so much water? Why do animals choke on the products that we design? We'd be talking about the same thing, but the level of complexity is nowhere near what it is now. So I think if you look at the fact we're still making plastic that birds and whales choke on, it shows you how hard it is to change systems with design and how much we have to think about responsible design as not a one-year job or a five-year job, or a 10-year job, it's probably a hundred years of the best minds, including everyone on this call. And we are not going to figure it out in generation two. I'm in generation two, I guess. No, maybe I'm generation one. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm one of the early generations. You're, you're probably gen four. It'll be gen 12, honestly. Um, so our job is to prepare the path for the designers who come after us and to give them the tools to say, hey, this framework's really good make it better or this tool is really good make it better but we won't solve responsible design it's um it's the quest it's like the moonshot of our profession for the next 50 years it's not something that i'll figure out on a whiteboard at facebook i wish i could but it won't happen like that and um kind of following up on responsible design how do you keep misused cases and bad, act bad actors in mind when designing products as impactful as the Facebook app? I think we just try and think as, of as many cases as we can. We kind of call them cautionary use cases. Um, I think also when we talk about bad things that happen on the internet, we often think of people who are setting out to do bad things. And for sure, bad we call them bad actors. Bad actors are responsible for terrible things on the internet, and but sometimes they're the easiest problems to solve because they're trying to do something bad. You can see the signs of badness. A lot of the really challenging things on the internet come from people just being people, you know, like getting angry, getting upset, not understanding how something works. Um, so I think when you're doing cautionary use cases, you can't just think of like criminals. Um, You've got to design systems that work for someone who's had a long day at work. They're super tired. Um, their kids have been awake all night. Um, they're really worried about a change that's being made in their town. 
and they see a post on Twitter or Reddit or Facebook that is about that topic, is that person a bad actor? No, they just haven't been given the support in their moment of vulnerability. That person is vulnerable and they might do an all caps message that offends someone else that causes a report that escalates. So I think, I think sometimes we want there to be bad, bad guys. And if we stop the bad guys, like it's a, like it's a Western, um, but actually it's a lot of people who are vulnerable, who are in pain or who need help. And I think that's maybe the way to look at this problem. Not, obviously we have to have steps for the bad actors, for people who are scamming or performing criminal acts or who are doing things that require law enforcement intervention or breaking laws. But I think most of the pain that we see on the internet is actually from people who themselves are struggling and they don't know how to manage in this complex thing that is the internet. So we have to design for that. Um, a lot of people, 3 billion people, it's not like 1 million supervillains. <laughs> it's just like 2 billion people who can have a really bad day. How do you design for that bad day? So that's kind of the way I try and look at the problem. Be compassionate to the people who are trying to learn how to use the internet, which is all of us. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, way to like look at it, um, especially like just being compa compassionate to everybody, not just like what you like think um, or who you think uh, you should be compassionate towards, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, following up with uh, the next question, I think this is our final like uh, question that we have and then afterwards we can focus more on the q a questions yeah um but what do you think the future of uh responsible design looks like um as artificial intelligence evolves oh that's such a good question i think I'm always giving you overly long philosophical answers, but Adriana, you knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I think it's, it's perfect, though. I'm I feel sorry. like your background in philosophy really <laughs> encaptures what design is also. <laughs> so I'm going to give a slightly long intro. I think the last 10, 15 years of artificial intelligence has been in a way for consumer products. So I'm not talking about what IBM is doing or SAP or what's happening on a factory, because I don't know that well enough, but consumer products. It's often been about efficiency and convenience. It's like, it's the idea that we just want that pizza faster. So we're gonna use artificial intelligence to figure out a faster route through town. Or I don't wanna be bored and I don't wanna scroll too much. So give me something really entertaining and artificial intelligence um, hopefully gives us something entertaining. I think, I think this is like the junk food era of artificial intelligence, because we know that convenience is not the most important thing to give to humans. I know it sometimes feels like it, but I feel like the future of artificial intelligence is what I would call human agency. And maybe just by analogy, a car. You don't know how a car, I don't know how a car works. Like I know there's internal combustion and something, but and I, I know that if I, if I do certain things, things go terribly, but there's incredibly powerful, actually in many cases, artificial intelligence behind the car, like detecting lane violations. And, but what are, you know, you feel in charge of the car. I think great artificial intelligence gives you agency. You, you don't understand entirely how things work, nor should you. You're not a, a mechanical engineer specializing in automotive braking systems. You know that when you press the accelerator, it does it reliably, even though behind the scenes, there is incredible machine intelligence at work. So I think, let's imagine we had a decade of the junk food era of artificial intelligence, which is convenience, faster, quicker, easier. Don't make me think, no friction. I don't wanna wait. <laughs> don't show me a pop-up. I don't care. Um, and I hope the next decade of artificial intelligence is to say, how do we make people feel like they are in control of this thing? Um, and I think the car is a great analogy. I do feel in control. I don't understand it. It's full of technology. I couldn't repair it if I tried. Um, but I feel like I have agency. I feel like I have, I'm in charge of my destiny. So I, I think the challenge for designers who are working with artificial intelligence is not to get carried away by the efficiency and the convenience that artificial intelligence brings and think of it more as how do I make this person feel like they control the system? 
like a really good example is um you, you know the nest the nest thermostat that was like every designer's dream project from like five years ago what was really lovely about that is thermostats are terrifying and complicated like have you ever taken the front of a thermostat off and it's like if you cut the red wire you die <laughs> or it's connected to 400 gallons of hot water you die and like thermostats so they had all these buttons on them and it was a terrible user experience and I, the answer was don't get people to think about the complexity don't give them more buttons they don't want more buttons they just want to make their house comfortable that's what that's agency i feel like i can make my house comfortable i don't want to understand how a boiler works or i don't want to understand which wire i have to cut and just by going like that my house is more comfortable and sometimes i don't even need to turn it because it has learned through machine intelligence when i like to feel comfortable so for me that is the future of responsible design for machine learning and artificial intelligence is if last decade was the decade of convenience i want this decade to be the decade of agency i want to feel like i control my destiny i don't need to understand it i don't need a hundred switches but i need to feel like i can make my house more comfortable and it doesn't matter what you're doing with artificial intelligence to me that is the goal That's a really good goal to have, I believe. Um, and I think that's also the future of like a lot of design is just making like the experience as seamless as possible. Um, and um, yeah, I think we're gonna answer one question from the Q&A sure. because I think we're running uh, out of a time a little, um, but let's see. Um, there was this one question that, related to uh responsible design um let me see where it is <laughs> uh sandra did you did you save it <laughs> i can't find it <laughs> what I feel like it, okay um i'm just kidding <laughs> I oh i thought yeah Sorry. <laughs> um, as UX designers, we create experiences to maximize. Oh, wait, we already asked that one. Sorry. <laughs> oh, wait, I think it's a different one, but it's kind of the same. But, but, yeah. but with recent awareness, like via movies, like The Social Dilemma, um, they raise ethical concerns for mm -hmm. us as designers. Um, so how do you see it? I know that's it's kind of like related to what we talked about responsible design. Um, but how do you see, um, like those concerns that are being raised? Um, and do you, like, I know you said that there won't be a solution until like, you know, generations pass us. Um, but right now, uh, how do you see that? I think that any industry has, um, hopefully has this type of critique. And I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of critique. I think every designer has to be, we all know like what the basis of our profession is critique. Um, I think we also know there's good critique and there's not so helpful critique. If someone walks into your studio and says, I hate that work, or you're the worst designer I've ever worked with, we, we call that not helpful critique. Um, but all critique is is helpful and valuable so when i when i when i watch things like that or i read articles i i try and do it in a spirit of design critique what am i trying to take away here what can i learn um and i i think maybe it's related a little bit to the last thing we spoke about i think whenever you have a system where people don't feel agency um we want it to be better and we want there to be a reason why i don't feel in control you know like the democratic process it's something where a lot of people don't feel agency. The economic system is something where people don't feel agency. And I think we also know in those very complex systems like democracy and economics and social networks, they're not as simple as we want them to be. We, we want there to be one person who fixes it or one, one bad guy who, who's the reason why it's all bad, but really any la sufficiently large collection of humans is super difficult to achieve a very particular goal out of. So I think it's right that that critique comes and we have to listen to it. I do want it to be helpful critique. Um, 
like any designer, I, I just want to make my work better and I want to be thoughtful and responsible. Um, the most helpful critique is critique I can use. Like you've both been in design critiques where someone says, uh, if you thought about this one extra thing, this would make a difference. And you're like, yes, thank you. Um, whereas if someone simply says you're doing it wrong, you're like, hey, I, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but um, so, so I think it may be a general thing is I'm very, I'm very welcoming of that critique. I, I do try and treat it as design critique and take what is helpful. And, but to me, it's a sign that people don't feel agency. Um, if I, if I go to Twitter or if I go to Reddit or newspapers and I look at what people are anxious about, it's normally complex systems where they don't feel in control or where they feel vulnerable. Um, if I go to next door, <laughs> I mean, you choose your social network, right? Um, so I think as an industry and as designers, we're obviously not doing a good enough job, um, even though I accept it's hard to do, to give people that sense of agency. And the tricky thing is it's not always obvious how to do that. It's not like you just, like the thermostat example, do you give people more control? So do you give them a hundred buttons? Do you put warning signs over the thermostat? People are trying to achieve many things. They're not just trying to achieve utility. They want delight and they want comfort and they want status. So I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not being like um, difficult by not sort of giving you a straightforward answer, but I think great design is about accepting the complexity of the problem. Um, and the, the final analogy I'd use you, like in the early 1900s, everyone thought that you could make cities better by a better urban planning. If we just put big open boulevards, we planted trees down the middle, and then we had big squares and libraries, and then the poor people would do this and the rich people would do this. That's not how cities work. <laughs> like Even if you've got the best intentions, people just do whatever they want. And, and I think maybe what's also happened is we've catered to one form of human emotion, which is comfort, pleasure, and convenience. And maybe we've got to cater to other human emotions just as thoughtfully. So. Look, um, I think about this problem all day, every day. I, I really am trying as many tools as I can as a designer to, to make it better. But I wanna be humble and say, some of these questions go back to the Greeks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is human beings have been struggling with them for millions of years. And that doesn't lessen my responsibility to be really clear. This is not me trying to use out a get out of jail card. I'm just trying to be sober about the problem that we're facing and maybe talk to the next generation of designers and say, it's not simple. And, and I think we're gonna to have to try different things, but I think if you spend the next 10 years of your career bringing human agency to experiences, you will be doing the right thing for the generation that follows you and you'll be doing the right thing for everyone because I think that's probably what we need now on the internet more than anything else. We need to feel like we're in control of this crazy system. <laughs> um, and it won't be by understanding it. I, I don't understand how the internet works. It won't be by having a thousand little levers I can pull. It'll be being very compassionate, building for people in their moments of vulnerability and saying, here it is, you, you can achieve your destiny here. It's up to you. And I think then we would have been doing a great job. But I won't get it done, Diana <laughs> and Sandra. You're gonna get it done. <laughs> or at least generation twelve will get it done. But we we I, my job is to make sure that your job is a little bit easier and I hope yeah. I hope I can do that. Yeah, I agree. Um I think that um it is a really complex answer. Um and like or in your answer was really good. Um and there's like no like straightforward answer for some of these questions because they are so big. Um but that was really insightful. Um and yeah, Sandra. Well, thank you for your time for speaking with us today, especially about um, system methods and the future of AR and responsible design. Thank you. So it looks like we're running out of time. Um, for the last couple of minutes, um, would you mind sharing like any of your socials, Charlie? Maybe like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, any of that. Um, you can probably drop it in the chat. Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah. Happy to drop it in. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, this is my privilege. Like, I feel like, you know, it's very rare that you get to talk to fellow designers about the future. Like, we're always like heads down and like just trying to get things done. But nothing makes me more hopeful than meeting people like you and knowing that you'll do a better job than I did. And as long as like I don't hand you like a car crash, I'm trying not to hand you a car crash, but like I'm so optimistic because there are people like you 
and you're asking these questions. So um, it's going to be all right. And you're the reason why. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is really great. Um, thank you. I guess we will go back to the main stage. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this was such a great discussion and I'm so excited we, had, we were able to do this. I appreciate you both. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye. Ciao.